God, we, uh, we come to you this morning. And right off the bat this morning, we want to thank you for your blood. God, we realize this morning that it's only by your blood that we are righteous, God. It's only by your sacrifice that we can stand before you. And so, God, we worship you in this house this morning. We thank you for what you've done. And so, God, as we, as we stand here today, God, as we prepare to, to talk about your word, God, I pray that you would give us wisdom, God, that you give us understanding, and that you would help us receive what you have for us this morning. God, we want to know you. We want to follow you. We want to be your disciples. God, we love you so much. We love you so much, Jesus. And it's through your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, good morning. Good morning. It's uh, good to see you this morning. And uh, this morning is a great morning to be here because uh, in the next few weeks we're going to be talking about uh, following Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it really mean to follow Jesus and uh, what I feel like happens to us because of where we are in the world, we hear Jesus talk about follow me in the four gospels and we kind of cheapen it. We cheapen what it means to follow Jesus and so sometimes we reduce uh, following Jesus to coming to church and to reading your Bible and and we think that those things is what it means to follow Jesus. But in the next few weeks, I want us to get a better understanding, a deeper understanding of what it truly means to follow Jesus. And so, I, I feel like that in the Bible Belt, uh, where we are, there's this weird thing that happens when we begin talking about following Jesus. It's that... Everybody identifies as Christian in the Bible Belt. Almost everybody identifies as a Christian in the Bible Belt, and that's because of this weird phenomenon that's happened in the last hundred years or so. Uh, it's called cultural Christianity. And so what that means is, in the early 1900s, there was a series of revivals. We know it now as the Second Great Awakening. And the bottom line is that Christianity became popular in the United States. It became the normal. It became the regular, the everyday. Everybody started identifying as Christian. And so cultural Christianity happens when being a Christian is the popular thing to do. So what happens is there's some people who uh, have been convicted and, and have given their life to Christ and uh, people begin to see that they're um, that that's the going thing. And so they pick up um, the rules that Jesus' followers take up and they begin acting like Christians without ever becoming Christians. And before long you have people who have identified as Christians but who have never actually given their heart and life to Jesus. And that's... Uh, kind of where our area has been for the last hundred or so years. There's people who come to church and people who act like Christians, people who believe uh, morally uh, like Christians, but they have never actually become followers of Jesus. These people are good, upright, moral people who have never had a personal relationship with Jesus. And so... What that means for us is that following Jesus isn't as clear cut as it is in other areas of the world. The, the idea of following Jesus is kind of ingrained into our culture. But we have to be able to realize that everyone who identifies as Christian is not necessarily a follower of Jesus. And what I mean by that is I had a, a speech class in uh, college and we were talking about Christianity one day and um, this uh, one boy, he 
he said, well, I, I'm a Christian. I mean, I'm American. Everybody who is American is Christian, right? And that's the attitude, the, the viewpoint that I'm talking about this morning. And uh, what many people do is they, they believe that you become a Christian by following a set of rules and regulations. And so, uh, Christian, they believe that Christianity is more about a do. You, 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 you just become a Christian and then you do these things. You, if you begin acting like a Christian, you are a Christian. That's the idea that many people have. And when you have people acting like Christians who have never had their heart transformed by the power of the gospel, you have a shallow religious form of Christianity that was, is totally different than what Christ came to do. And uh, my point this morning, long time getting there, is that Christianity is never about a do, it's about a who. And so, we, we say things like, Christians read their Bible, they pray, they go to church, they give money, they're social conservatives, so they vote Republican, they dress modestly, and then, um, on the other side of that, Christians don't do this list of things, they don't go to X-rated movies, and they don't cuss, and they don't drink alcohol, and all that. And so, when we have this list, and uh, this list of rules, people think that you become a Christian by becoming a social conservative, by voting Republican, by going to church, by uh, reading your Bible, that that's how you become a Christian. But none of that makes you a Christian. So it's uh, election week this week, right? It's election week, and I just want to let you know that just because you vote Republican doesn't make you a Christian. And just because you vote Democrat doesn't mean you're going straight to hell. Despite what some people will tell you. Just want to get that out there. You want my commentary on the election. There it is. So, but, but really there's people who identify that way. That, that I'm on the right wing of the political view. And so that means that I'm a Christian. I have Christian morals and Christian values. It reminds me of uh, some experiences I've had in my past, and I'm sure you've probably had an experience like this too growing up in a small town. Um, Sometimes in the small town, um, you are identified more by who you are than what you do. And so, a lot of times it shows up on ball teams. Uh, just, I'm not pointing out any ball teams or anything, but where you see it at sometimes is uh, people play because they know somebody, they know the coach, or the coach is friends with somebody. So it's about who you know, and regardless of how well you play ball, um, you may or not may not get to pl- may or may not get to play based on whether or not who you know, and so. It also happens in jobs, so if you want a job at a particular place, you've got to know somebody, and it don't really matter how well you can perform, it matters who you know, if you had an experience like that before. And so, Christianity is kind of like a, a small town where it's more about who you know than what you can do. And so, Christianity is never about a list of rules and regulations, it's all in knowing Jesus, having a personal relationship with Jesus. It don't matter, uh, and and that makes some people upset because they're really good performers. And and so, if you can perform really well as a Christian, you don't like this because you want to perform and be judged on how well you can perform. But if you're kind of like me and you mess things up, it's a really good thing that it's not about what I do. It's about who I know. And... uh, I want to show you this in the scripture we read just a few minutes ago. Um, Jesus, where we pick up in the story, Jesus has uh, started his public ministry, and it's really going good. 
Jesus. It, it's really, he's done some amazing things. Um, he's calmed a storm. He has healed some people. And he has preached the Sermon on the Mount so far in the book of Matthew. And then he does something really crazy. So Jesus has the attention of everybody in Jerusalem at this time. The eye is on Jesus. And people are focused on Jesus. The Pharisees, they believe that maybe there's something different about this guy named Jesus. And then Jesus does this crazy, out-of-the-ordinary thing. He walks up to a tax collector and he says follow me and while it sounds crazy to us that Jesus could love an IRS guy it, it was even crazier in the first century and so in the first century Rome ruled the known world the entire known world Rome had control over. They had this huge army that would come in and take over an area, and then they would leave some of that army to maintain control. But as we know, a big army takes a lot of money to feed and arm and maintain. And so Rome had to take taxes from every region that they conquered, and that, mean, that meant that they had to go in and get somebody to collect the taxes. So what this looked like was, they would sell the right to take up taxes to somebody in that town. And so, the Romans would come in, they would conquer, and then they would begin an auction on who was going to get to take up the money. And Rome would give these tax collectors, whoever was the highest bid, they would give them a percentage of what they needed to take up. They would give them you know, 10% or 20% of everybody's salary you need to take up. But you can take up as much over that as you want to for your own profit. And so what was happening was that ta tax collectors were getting rich by taking up these ridiculous amounts of taxes from the people. And giving it to the enemy. And so it would kind of be like today if, um, if somebody in your family stole huge amounts of money to fund ISIS. That, that was kind of the sentiment of these people towards tax collectors. They were the most hated people in Jerusalem. And so when Jesus walked up to Matthew the tax collector, everybody was shocked. They were like, really, Jesus? A tax collector? Really? That's who you, you want to be in your circle of friends? Really, Jesus? That's who you want to identify with? Really? Are you sure? And I don't know if Jesus had like a public relations guy or not, but if he did, he died right here from a heart attack. Because this was social suicide for Jesus. This was not going to help his ministry whatsoever. Nobody liked tax collectors. They still don't like tax collectors, but they hated them even more back then. And so Jesus, he walks up to Matthew and he says, I want you to follow me. He didn't give Matthew a list of rules or regulations that he had to follow. He didn't say... Matthew, if you will stop tax collecting, and if you will stop this, 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 and this, you can begin to follow me. And he didn't say, Matthew, if you will start going to synagogue twice a week, and if you'll begin memorizing some scripture, and if you'll begin to get your life together, maybe in a year or two, we can work something out where you can follow me. That wasn't the attitude of Jesus. He met Matthew exactly where he was. He met Matthew exactly where he was and said, Follow me. Follow me. There was no strings attached and there was no... Uh, small print 
Jesus simply said, follow me. And then if that wasn't unbelievable enough, the scene changes all of a sudden. And it says that Jesus is reclined at a table in this house. So we don't think about Jesus like laying down beside a table a lot. But Jesus was literally like laying down on his side next to a table. And the next line would have shocked everybody in Jerusalem. It says, Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. First thing I want you to see is that Jesus was comfortable around sinners and tax collectors. He was comfortable. He wasn't uptight. He wasn't prudish. He was comfortable with them. He may have even laid his head over on somebody's shoulder. But the next line tells us that they were comfortable around him too. And so these people were reclining at a table together. These people hadn't changed any. They were still tax collectors and sinners. They were still dirty, rotten traitors to Jerusalem. But they were comfortable around Jesus. So I wonder this morning if we are, are as a church, are we comfortable around sinners? And tax collectors. And even more important question is, are they comfortable around us? So I love Jesus' model of ministry here. He invites somebody into a relationship with him. He says, come and, and follow me. Be my friend. Come into my inner circle. Didn't require any changes. Didn't require any rules or regulations, but he just invites Matthew to be his friend. And then he says, let's go eat. Let's go hang out. And he's just comfortable around him. These, these, these people, they're just comfortable around Jesus. And they eat and then Jesus says, I, I'm willing to meet you wherever you are. And that's an amazing model for ministry. There was no program. There was no uh, church service. It was just Jesus inviting people to be his friend and then spending time with those people. We don't know if, it, if Jesus ever told them to stop being tax collectors or not, but Whatever Jesus done must have worked because Matthew, the tax collector, wrote the book that we're reading. It obviously worked, but Jesus never told them about a do. He didn't say do this or do that or don't do this. He said, follow me. Follow me. And what we're guilty of so many times is that we want to make Following Jesus complicated. And so if, if we're doing really well, if we're uh, staying away from that sin that, that, that always gets us, then we feel like we're following Jesus well. But if we're, uh, following into, if we're falling into that thing, we feel like we're lagging behind Jesus. But our relationship with Jesus is not about a do. It's about a who. It's about knowing Jesus in a personal relationship. And so what I'm afraid many people have done is that we've reduced being a Christian to this, this list of rules and coming to church and, and doing ministry and we've forgotten to have that relationship with Jesus. We've forgotten, we've got so mixed up in Christianity that we've forgotten to know Christ I know that I'm guilty of that that sometimes I get so 
uh, mixed up and focused on church and, and this and that that I forget to know Jesus, to, to spend time with Jesus, to be with Jesus. Following Jesus, it, it, it's not about rules, it's not about regulations, it's about spending a lifetime learning who Jesus is and becoming His friend. What's happened in Christianity today is that many of us know Jesus as our Savior, but we've never known Him as our friend. And so He's just a distant, far-off Savior, but that's not all He wants from you. He wants to be close to you. He wants to be friends with you. He wants to know about every detail of your life. He wants to know you in a personal, personal way. Did you know a personal relationship with uh, the deity is what separates Christianity from every other religion? Nobody else claims to be able to know God in a personal way. But that's what we are invited into when we follow Jesus is to know the God of the universe, the Savior of the world on a first name basis. We can be friends with Jesus. Following Jesus is, is an adventure of a lifetime. He'll take you to some crazy places and some terrifying places. But following Jesus is about pursuing Jesus for all of your life. Not about coming to church. It's about following Jesus. So this morning you could change your lifestyle to try to become a Christian, but that won't do it. You can change um, how you dress to look more like a Christian, but that won't make you any more Christian. This morning you can come to church three times a week, but that won't make you a Christian. You can stop hanging out with your old friends and you can start hanging out with no Christian friends, but that won't make you a Christian. You can start serving in the church. You can be here every time we're doing something at this place, but that won't make you a Christian. It won't mean that you're following Jesus. You can go vote Trump on Tuesday, but that won't make you a Christian. You can throw out your country CDs and your rap CDs and listen to every Christian song that's ever been written, but that won't make you a Christian. That doesn't mean that you're following Jesus. Following Jesus simply means that you are getting to know Him. You've given your life to know who He is. It's about surrendering to Him and saying, Yes, Jesus, I want you as my Savior, but I also want you as my friend. For the rest of my life, I want to walk with you and come to know you. And as the, the crazy thing is that as you come to know Jesus, as you come to find out who He is, you'll begin to fall in love with Him. And you'll realize that you don't want to go a day without Him. You don't want to go a day without Him. Man, I grew up, and, and I was raised by awesome parents, and I grew up in a, in a, in a church, but, and I grew up as a Christian. I give my life to Jesus at six, at six years old. That means for 15 years I've been a Christian. But, man, it wasn't until a few years ago that I knew what it really meant to have a friend in Jesus. To have a friend in Jesus, not just a far off Savior, not just a God of the universe, but to have a friend. When I'm having a hard day, I can just go to Jesus and say, man, I don't know what to do. If you don't help me, I, I, I'm going to make a mess. And I can go to Jesus and say, I, 
I'm overwhelmed. Don't know what to do. Jesus, I need your help. Jesus, I need you to help me figure this out. Could you, could you speak to me, Jesus? And so Jesus, for me, He's not just, not just a Savior, but He's a friend. And so, you may say this morning, well, I've been a Christian for a long time, and, and some of you have been Christians way longer than I've been alive. And so you may be thinking, Cody, I've been a Christian a while. I don't need to make a decision to follow Jesus. You can be a Christian and have never decided to follow Jesus. To know Jesus as your friend. And so I'll just let you know this, this week. I, I told Jesus that, Jesus, I want to follow you. And I don't know what all that, that means, and I don't know what all, where all you'll take me. But, but I want to follow you. Wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, I want to follow you. And don't get me wrong, I, I didn't get saved this week or anything, but um, just a fresh commitment to say, I'm with you, Jesus. I want to walk with you, Jesus. I want to be with you, Jesus. I don't want church and I don't want religion. I just want to know Jesus. I want to know who He is and I want to live my life with Him. Every single day I want to know Jesus more personally and more intimately every single day. I want to become dependent on Jesus where if I woke up one day and Jesus wasn't there, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. So this morning, the praise team's going to come in just a second. And I, I just want to let you all know this morning that, that I want us to be a church in pursuit of Jesus. Are you in pursuit of Jesus? We live in this fast-paced world where it's easy to get distracted. And we're facing pressures. And we have a lot going on here at church, but I don't, want to get a, I don't want us to get lost in all of that. More than I want us to have programs at church, more than I want us to have awesome worship experiences, more than I want all of that, I want us to be a people who are pursuing Jesus, who know Jesus in a personal way, a people who have been captivated by Jesus who in, and that were standing in awe of who He is. And so this morning, here's what, I, here's what I want us to do. If everybody would, could you just bow your head and close your eyes? I know it's churchy, but I want to invite you this morning to follow Jesus and so right now if you have never decided to follow Jesus to know him personally and to call him friend if you want to do that this morning you can just slip your hand up right now maybe you've been a Christian for a long time but you've never really known Jesus as a friend You've never really known who He is and you've never really walked with Him day by day. You can slip up your hand. Or maybe you're here this morning and you just got distracted. You got caught up in the world and you have got caught up in everything you have to do from day to day and you just need to refocus this morning. You just need a fresh commitment to Jesus. You need to just say that, that Jesus, I, I do want to follow you. I do want to pursue you. I do want relationship with you. I don't just want to know you as my Savior. But I want to know you as my friend. If that's you, you can slip your hand up. I want to pray for you this morning. I'm not going to make you run up an aisle, but I just want to pray for you. Let's pray together. Lord, we, uh, 
We thank you for who you are, God, and that, that following you has nothing to do with what we do, but it has to know with who we know. God, I pray that we would be a church who's in pursuit of you, who knows you and has learned to love you. God, I pray that we would be a church who is following after you. God, that we wouldn't be distracted by the things in this world, but God, we could keep our eyes on you because you are all that we need, Jesus. You are all that we need. God, we love you and we thank you. And it's through Jesus we pray this morning. Amen.